That's great. Well, welcome again to our meeting this morning at 140 Clark Street, if you're joining us here in person. And if you're joining us online, great to have you join us as well. My name is Mark. I'm one of the leaders here at Christ Central, and I'm going to be continuing to preach through the book of Acts, which we've been going through over the last few months. We're up to chapter 6. I'm not sure how far we'll go, whether we go through it all or not, but it's been a fun journey so far, so let's keep going. And, uh, whoa, that's why we need a new stage if I, <laughs> if I do that. <laughs> anyway, after what seemed like a great start for the early church, we've seen that there are one or two issues and challenges recently which we've looked at in chapters 4 and 5. The apostles were arrested and imprisoned twice. Two of the church members dropped down dead uh, on gift day because they were lying about what they'd given. We're so looking forward to our gift day coming up next week. Well, we were doing anyway. Um, <laughs> these issues keep on coming uh, in chapter 6, and we'll see things start getting overlooked by the apostles. Uh, complaining starts happening. Division starts to occur. Let's not ever get the impression that church life is going to be plain sailing. There are always challenges and difficulties, but God is always with us in them. Great to hear that word that Emma brought where we sometimes look around and we see, oh, this doesn't look so great, but then we can look around and we see what God is actually doing. So some of these difficulties come from outside forces, uh, opposition from authorities, things like that. Sometimes they come internally within the church, as we see here. Um, there are things that get neglected and you know, it can be comforting in a way to us because every church has something that they don't do so well. If you are expecting us to be the perfect church, maybe you've just joined and you think, this is a great church, you know, just warn you, don't get too illusioned or you're going to get disillusioned. Uh, you're never going to find the perfect church. And some people actually keep moving from church to church, trying to find the one that doesn't have any issues. You'll never find it. Um, and we see that here. Anyway, let's read Acts chapter 6, and we're just going to read the first seven verses. It says this, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, Look, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We'll turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. All right, so here is a situation where the church is caring for people who are in need. And that's great, isn't it? We saw how in Acts chapter 4 and verse 34 it said, you know, there was no needy persons among them. People were looking out for each other. They were caring for each other. Some people were selling land to raise money to give to people. Some people were giving their possessions and property. It's like, okay, it's not mine. You can share it. It's all ours together. There was no needy persons among them. Acts 4, Acts 2. Well, it started off really well, but here in Acts 6, that's not the case. There clearly are some needy people among them. An issue had arisen, and it was over the widows in the church. Now, in those days, the women wouldn't have been educated and self-sufficient in terms of providing an income uh, for their family, and there wouldn't have been any government help to do it. Um, so the husband would have been the primary means of support. Most women would have married young, and the husband would have been the one who was providing for the family. But if the husband died, she was very vulnerable. The wife, the widow, was very vulnerable. 
usually her children would take care of her, take the responsibility and support her, or extended family. But that wasn't always the case. And so here the church is seeing there's some people where that hasn't happened, it can't happen, we're going to come and make sure that these widows aren't left vulnerable, aren't left not provided for. They're not going hungry. It was a great idea. Last time we focused, when I was preaching, on the importance of the preached word and how the word of God and the disciples and the apostles said we can't stop preaching the word. We focused in on that. But church ministry isn't all about preaching. There are practical works to be done as well. And of course, also in church life, God moves sovereignly, miraculously by His Spirit. So we have words, works, and wonders. And that's about the closest you're going to get from me to a (laughs) three-point sermon. Those aren't actually the points of my message, (laughs) so I'm only halfway there. Anyway, when it came down to it, the plan that they had to look after these widows didn't work out as well as it sounded. There were two different groupings of believers. They were all Jews at this point. There were the Hebraic Jews. Those were the Jews who'd always stayed in Jerusalem around the temple. They'd stuck with the faith uh, and all that it, it was before the Romans occupied. Now, the Romans have now come in. Life's pretty difficult for the Hebraic Jews in Jerusalem, but they've stuck with it. They're like, no, we're persevering. We're going with it. And there was the Hellenistic Jews. Now, the Hellenistic Jews, when persecution had come, when the, Hebrew, when the Romans had come in, they'd kind of fled and gone further away from Jerusalem. And they'd actually become a bit more like the culture around them. Uh, they'd picked up the Greek language. They'd picked up much of the Greek culture. But they were all believers here in the church. They'd all People had been saved from both groups. They were all Christians, and uh, they were in the church together. But what there was, was there was probably some underlying tension between these two groups of Jewish believers. There was some racial, cultural, maybe ethnic conflict as they're trying to work things out. And it seems like in this passage that we see the Hebraic Jews are getting treated better than the Hellenistic Jews in terms of the distribution of food. The Hebraic widows, they're all getting theirs. They're fine. They're being looked after. Some of the Hellenistic widows, the the Christian believers, they weren't getting that. And so, they began to complain about the situation. This group of believers was complaining and saying, well, this group of believers is getting preferential treatment. They're getting a better deal from it. Seems like there's some kind of favoritism going on. So, they're starting to grumble. They're starting to complain. They're starting to say, this isn't fair. It's not right. It's a bit of racism bit of prejudice going on here. It's becoming a real problem for the apostles because there's the practical feeding problem. Some widows are going hungry. And there is the division in the church issue as well. So, of course, the apostles get to hear about it. Now, you've got to imagine that at this point, the apostles are probably already pretty overwhelmed. The church has been growing quickly. If we look at the numbers in Acts, it's already gone from about 120 people on the day of Pentecost, just before the day of Pentecost. Suddenly on the day of Pentecost, you know, you get 3,000 saved. Around this time, if you add all the numbers up, it's probably gone to around 12, 13,000 people in the church in a pretty short space of time. That would have caused some huge problems for the apostles. They would have had to organize people, to disciple them, even baptizing that number of people. Can you imagine how much time that was going to take to baptize that many people? It's like how many, how, we're seeing how long it takes to vaccinate um, people here in New Brunswick. You think, oh, this is going quite slow. Well, there's lots of people mobilized to do that. Here are the apostles. They're thinking we need to baptize all these people. There's thousands getting saved all the time. Great thing happening, quite difficult in terms of their time. So now there's some very real practical needs, and things are just not happening. Some people are falling through the cracks. Some people are getting overlooked. 
I mean, the thing is, this isn't even a bad church, is it? This, this was a great church. It's the first church. It was the great church. It wasn't as though they had leaders who didn't care. It's not as though these leaders haven't been well-trained. They've been with Jesus for three years. It's not as though they have doctrinally unsound leaders. Many of them are going to go on and write the Bible. It's a pretty good qualification. And of course, they've all been filled with the Holy Spirit. But the circumstances just mean that they can't handle it all. It's like the situation in Exodus 18 when, with Moses. You remember when Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes to visit. And he's got, Moses has got everyone coming to him with all their issues, all their problems that they need sorting out. And it was too much for him to deal with. Things were going pretty well on the whole, but Jethro said, hey, you need to start to do something about this. Very similar situation here in the book of Acts. Now, here in our church, we don't have 12,000 people to look after. Maybe we've got just over 200. But still, it can be a challenge to make sure that everyone is feeling cared for uh, by those of us who are on staff, those of us who are like Joe and myself, who are full-time elders, others on staff like Jody, Gemma, looking after the youth and children. We've got circumstantial things that make it difficult. COVID's made it harder to make sure you can keep in touch with everyone. You know, it can be easy for things to fall through the cracks. Maybe there's certain things that are going on in your life that we haven't realized, that we don't know about. We can assume maybe you're doing okay when actually you're not. It's not because we don't care. It's just how things can get sometimes because of circumstances. And that's how it got for Moses, and that's how it got for these apostles as well. So in Exodus, Jethro wisely advises Moses. He says, hey, divide people up into smaller groups and appoint leaders over each group to, to deal with these issues. They can be looking after the smaller groups. And, and we do a similar thing here. We would love everyone to be connected to a life group, much smaller group than the bigger group that might meet here on a Sunday or watch online. And uh, there's a much better chance of people knowing what's going on in your life, that you're being cared for, you're being known uh, personally. And uh, the life group leaders and the whole of the life group can support each other in most situations, maybe leaving some of the more tricky situations to be dealt with by those of us who are on the pastoral team. Anyway, here in Acts 6, the 12 apostles knew they had a big problem on their hands, and they had to decide what they were going to do about it. Now, I guess it would have been tempting for them to just say, okay, look, one of us 12 is going to have to take this on. Matthias, you're the new guy here. You know, you don't seem to have got as much on your plate yet as some of the rest of us. You know, you're just coming into it. Maybe you could pick this one up, Matthias. Would have been tempting to do that. And to some extent, this is what churches do with eldership teams and staff teams. We can see a need, and so we default to asking someone on the eldership team to deal with it, or we default to asking someone on the staff team to look after it. And honestly, as I've been preparing this, I mean, when we've been aware, you know, we just go through the Bible and we preach it passage by passage. I think this is an area that we still have to keep being reminded about as a church. Um, and we have to work on as eldership and staff because we have a desire to get more and more people involved in ministry. I'll talk more about that later. But the temptation is for something to come up and us just think, oh, I'll handle that. I know during my working week, it's much easier for me to think, oh, I can deal with that, than think, I'll find someone else to deal with that. And that's a temptation that maybe I have to resist. The reason is because it's easier to make that decision quickly, find a solution, deal with it yourself. But that's not the solution that God is looking for. The reason being, those of us who are on the eldership team, on the staff, can end up getting burnt out. And also, God wants the whole church to be involved in ministry. The biblical answer isn't for the leaders to do everything. It's not just to keep increasing staffing. And the apostles realize that if they took on more and more things, things aren't, are just going to fall more and more. Plates are going to fall. And they say, 
well, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order for us to meet to wait on tables. It's like, if we start doing this, this is going to fall. This is going to suffer. And this is what we really feel personally we are called to as an apostle. Obviously, not everyone is called to that, but the apostles knew they were. And so they said, we, we can't do this because this is going to suffer. It's a real danger that preaching and prayer could slide. So what they decided to do was appoint others who could take on responsibility for the work. And they actually let the people choose the leaders themselves. And they gave them just two criteria. They said they've got to be full of the Spirit and they've got to be wise, have the gift of wisdom, full of the Spirit and wisdom. Interesting. You'd think they would say, actually, we know some people here who are really good administrators. That's one of the criteria we need. We need to look for some administrators. We maybe need to look for people who are good at math to make sure the food gets divided equally. It's no good just going out, oh, we're full of generosity. Yeah, give it all the Hebraic widows, all the food. Oh, there's none left. Never mind. You know, maybe we need some administrators. Maybe we need some people who are really good at math. Let's get some people with some real practical skills. The spiritual jobs, they can be left to the apostles. But the work and service that people do in the church isn't separated into spiritual and practical. Or spiritual and unspiritual, some people might say. God doesn't divide them out like that. It's all works of the Spirit using the gifts of the Spirit. So the apostles needed people who had the gift of wisdom to handle the division, the tension, the potential for disunity going on. We need wisdom to know how to handle things in this situation. They thought, it needs a spiritual gift of wisdom. People need to be full of the Spirit. We need Spirit-filled believers in every area of church life. Some people would say, oh, okay, so I think these are the first deacons in the church. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. I'm not so sure. They're not called deacons. Maybe. Who knows? Um, I think it's pretty clear, though, that this is the start of what we might call the priesthood of all believers. In other words, the work is for all the believers, not just those people who are staff or trained or qualified as priests or pastors. It's all of us. And Paul's going to go on and talk about this in his letters, in, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says this to the church in Corinth. He says, Now, to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing in the Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each as he determines. And in, and in Romans, he talks about other gifts as well. Some are gifts of administration, gifts of giving. There's a whole list of gifts in those two books. So you can imagine the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm going to give different gifts. You know, I'm going to give you the gift of healing. I'm going to give you the gift of prophecy. I'm going to give you the gift of speaking in tongues and interpretation. I'm going to give you the gift of administration. And they're all getting divided out. And then at the end, he's like, okay, who wants the gift of celibacy? Anyone want that? Who wants the gift of martyrdom? Not so sure. So, you know, but they're all given out. They're all gifts of the Spirit. And Paul says, everyone in Christ, everyone in the church, forms one body with many different parts. We've all got a part to play. And he goes on and he talks about the temptations that we face when we get those gifts. There's two temptations. He says there's the temptation to think that you are indispensable and you can do everything without needing anyone else. He says, the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. In other words, some people think, it's okay. I can do it all. I can cope. No, says Paul, we need each other. And there's the other temptation that we might face, which is, oh, I don't really fit here. I don't really belong in this body because the job I've got to do, the role I've got, isn't that important. And Paul says, look, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it wouldn't, for that reason, stop being part of the body. 
But God's placed all the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. In other words, Paul's saying, none of us are supposed to carry everything ourselves. All of us have got roles, every single one of us, to do in the body. Some are high profile, but some are not. Some are not so obvious. Paul actually says, those ones are indispensable. They should be treated with special honor, he says. So in the light of Paul saying that, I just want to pause and honor some people here in the area of cleaning, especially during these times of COVID. We've got a new building. Here we are, in it, many of us. Keeping it clean is not an easy job. If it wasn't kept clean, people would start to notice, people would start to comment. When it is kept clean, actually people don't realize. So it's, it's one of those jobs which is kind of a hidden job. People work hard at it, people don't really realize. I'm gonna show you a picture of what the building looked like. Hopefully you can see that, and online you should see it as well. This is what the building looked like last May before we started meeting in here. And this is a picture of, of those of us who are elders and some others praying in this building. We were prioritizing what we felt God had called us to do, praying. So we were here and we spent some time praying. And actually, just after that, God opened up this place for us to be able to meet here with the, with the city and other, others. So after we started meeting here, we, a whole lot of people then started to volunteer. They came in, you all came in, you painted, you see these different color paints, and making it look as good as it does today. And Trevor Parker agreed to manage the building, look after the maintenance. He included others such as Tim Bicknell, Dave Laver, Nathan Ward, Bob Bethel, and others in different aspects of it. Jackie Mwamini, who said she would love to serve here by cleaning the building every week. She comes down here every Saturday and cleans it, the whole place. She doesn't want paying for it. She says it's her service to God. Nobody sees her do it because she comes when no one else is here. But she cleans the building. Others have volunteered to be on the sanitization team during COVID between meetings. We've got a number of people doing that. Krista and Ella Rich, Gary and Barb Gallant, Suzanne Laver, Grace Rushworth, Jackie as well, um, John Waugh, Jody and Isaiah Ward. Do you notice on the floor, on the picture there, there's some quite dirty markings. Um, those are wax. That's wax markings. That is like super, super thick, sticky. It was here because there were shelves and other things when this was a hardware store. And uh, we got a quote from a cleaning company to see how much it would cost to clean those markings off. And they said $6,000. And we thought, oh, we might be putting some new flooring down in the future. We're not sure. We'll leave it. We've got to put tape down for COVID anyway. It's fine. We'll leave it. A few people tried to work at it. Jody tried to work at it. A few others tried to work at it. It was like, oh, this, you can get it up, but it's really slow work. It's really difficult. And... Uh, so we left it. And then Judy Bethel got in touch with me and said, could I clean this wax off the, off the floor? And I said, many have tried. <laughs> many have gone before and failed, but feel free to go. Feel free to work at it. So Judy and Bob often have been coming down here pretty much most days, pretty much every day I've been here working. Judy and Bob will come down and they will work on a part of the floor and they will clean it. And they've been doing it for days and weeks. Now, I wonder how many people have even noticed the difference. But if you look around, yeah, some of you have, great. <laughs> but it's just been going on hidden. But it's serving, it's making a difference. And these are just a few areas of church life where people are serving and there are many others as well. I just wanna commend people for serving in this way. It's wonderful for the church to be working together using their gifts. So anyway, that's what happened here in Acts. Those who had seen the need chose seven men. The church chose seven men. Stephen, a man full of faith, and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Procurus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Palm Pam Parmenas, I've spelt it all wrong in my notes, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. 
and the apostles pray and lay hands on them. These men were from a variety of different backgrounds, mostly from the Hellenistic Jews who were feeling overlooked. So the people had confidence that they were serving and looking after them uh, as well. And we see later on in Acts, these men were going to be involved in other areas of church life too. It wasn't just this area. They were full of the Holy Spirit. So Philip was an evangelist. We're going to see him soon uh, going to talk to an Ethiopian who came to follow Jesus, probably took the gospel to Africa. So that's Philip. He's one of these guys serving food, but he's also going to be an evangelist. Stephen, we see in the next passage, doing great wonders and signs and preaching the gospel power powerfully. And then actually he realizes he's been given the gift of martyrdom, and he is the first Christian martyr. We're going to see that next week. Okay, so that's it. We see a problem in the early church, but the problem was a catalyst for the body of Christ to begin to work together as God intended it to. So let's nail this down and get practical for us. When God saves us, he adds us to the church. When he adds us to the church, we're part of the local body of Christ, in our case here in Fredericton. And he fills us with his spirit, and he gives us gifts to use to build up and edify the church, as well as to go and reach others for Christ. And the challenge is for each one of us to be using our gifts and serving in some way. We might call it volunteering, but each one of us should be involved in some way. Many, like Philip and Stephen, might be involved in a number of different ways. So how about you? How are you using your gifts to serve and build up the church? Some of you might say, well, I've got a job with a lot of responsibility and I don't have any free time. That's great. But maybe your area of serving is in the gift of giving generously. And our gift day coming up next week is a great opportunity for you to bless the church and others as we give that money away. Some might say, actually, I don't have much money to give, but I've got more time on my hands, and so you can give more time. Maybe you're retired. You can serve in a number of areas, as Bob and Judy do. Even those who are on staff actually volunteer their time. Jody Ward is on the cleaning team and hosts meetings. Gemma serves with the youth. Emma serves with Kids Club. Women of the Word hosting meetings. Brent has run the big quiz. You know, we can all volunteer our time. You might think, well, I'm, I feel I've got the gift of teaching, and so I'm waiting to be asked to preach. Well, Stephen could have been feeling that, but instead, he got on with serving food to the widows. You might think, I don't know where I could serve. I don't know what the options are. Well, let me give you some areas we need people to serve in. Some of these require certain gifts and maturity in Christ, just as the situation in Acts did. There'll be one which fits you. Here's just a quick list. We need people for our welcome team, car parking duty, AV, especially our Sunday evening prayer times, various administrative tasks, social media, graphic design, video production and editing, website management, writers, bloggers, live streaming of our meetings, musicians, especially bass guitarists and electric guitarists. Great to have Joel leading on the electric today. Practical jobs around the building, people to hand out invitations to events, life group leaders, kids club, Ignite, Fuel, our youth group. Many of these things, there could be a place for you. Some of these roles are things that Brent has been doing in his job over the last year or so. Um, but we're not just looking to employ another member of staff. We were looking to see the body of Christ take on some of these things. So, if you're currently serving in the church in one or more ways, let me say and thank you and say well done. Whether it's a visible upfront role or whether it's an invisible behind the scenes role like Janet Norman who writes and reviews our policies for us. Essential job. No one's going to see her doing it. You're playing your part in the body of Christ here in Fredericton. If you're not currently serving, I would encourage you to pray about it and then to come and speak to Joe or myself and find out what role you could play. Maybe it's in one of those I've just mentioned. Maybe it's in another. In the early church, getting this problem sorted out, not overloading just a few people, making sure that the division wasn't keeping going and the, there was issues within the church meant that the church was able to continue to grow. 
Verse 7 says, So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That's what we want to see as a church. We want to see the church grow. We want to see more people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray about that a lot. It's the commission that God's given us. We're going to maybe sing about it. I think we probably can. We're going to sing about it in a moment or so. In fact, the band maybe can come back up and we'll just sing. We're going to pray. Spirit of God, breathe on your church. Pour out your presence. Speak through your words. We want everyone, every nation, Christ to be known. Our hope and salvation. But that won't happen by one or two of us doing everything. It won't happen just through having a good, well-staffed church. It will happen when every member of our church body plays their part by being filled with the Holy Spirit and using the gifts that God has given them. So why don't we pray right now? Let's stand together, shall we? Father God, I thank you that you have saved us. Thank you you've drawn us into your family, your church body. Lord, we pray, we pray that in every nation Christ would be known. We pray that you would use us as a church to reach many for Christ. And Lord, I pray, fill us with your Holy Spirit again. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, each one of us. Give us gifts. Lord, that we might use them in your service to edify, to strengthen, to build up the church and to reach out and see others one for Christ. And Lord, I pray each one of us, if we are not sure where we might fit, maybe we're new to the church, maybe our situation has changed, maybe we've just not quite seen it, Lord, I pray you'll help us to know how we fit into the body of Christ that we might work together as one with you as our head. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.